time, I'd like to inform all parties that today's call will be recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Again, today's call will be recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Thank you, and we will begin momentarily. And welcome. This is Karen Fox with NASA's Office of Communications, and I appreciate everybody joining us for this uh, media telecon about James Webb Space Telescope, what's been happening the last couple of weeks, and what is coming up next. We will have just a few opening remarks, uh, nice and quick, and then we will switch to questions from media on the line. As a reminder, you can dial star one to get into the queue for asking questions. Uh, here on the line, we have Keith Parrish. He is the Webb Observatory Commissioning Manager at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. We have Lee Feinberg, who is the Webb Optical Telescope Element Manager at NASA Goddard. Amy Lowe is on the line. She is the Webb Vehicle Engineering Lead at Northrop Grumman in Redondo Beach, California. And we have Jane Rigby, who is the Web Operations Project Scientist, also at NASA Goddard. Uh, so with no further ado, I will toss it over to Keith first for his introductory remarks. Yeah, good day, everybody. Um, we're just really excited to announce today that uh, Web is officially on station. 
uh, at its L2 orbit. And uh, we, we've just been, uh, this is just capping off just a remarkable 30 days. So our team this morning or this afternoon uh, fired what we call our station keeping thruster. Uh, they did that, uh, they fired that thruster for about 10 minutes, uh, actually five minutes, let me correct that, about five minutes, and we put about 1.5 meters per second in, and uh, that pretty much capped off all of our mid-course correction maneuvers that we've been doing along the way. So a super, super duper shout out to our flight dynamics team that navigated us all the way from Earth orbit all the way out to L2. Our Delta V team and our propulsion team all have just did a remarkable job to, to get us to this point uh, today. So since the last time, a couple weeks ago, we've been also been very busy doing a lot of other really good stuff since we uh, finished our deployments. We actually uh, got most, uh, we actually did all of the mirror deployments, got them off of their launch, uh, out of their launch uh, configuration, and Lee will talk a little bit more about that. The spacecraft team has continued to put the spacecraft through all of its paces, the, the flight operations team and the mission operations team and all of our engineering team have really become comfortable with operating web and uh, really continuing to get it, you know, get, getting to know it. Uh, over the past few days, we've actually got our KA band, or what we call our high-speed uh, data system or our communication equipment up and running, and we can fully, uh, we can transmit at the high data rates that we need to uh, get all the awesome science data back down to the, to the ground when we start doing science. You know, the last 30 days have been absolutely remarkable and we've got it behind us. And, uh, you know, it's an incredible accomplishment by, by the entire team. They continue to put in long hours and just, uh, you know, just uh, incredible achievement by so many. And, you know, the last 30 days, you know, we call that 29 days on the edge for 30 days on the edge, and we're just, you know, we're just so proud to be through that. But on the other hand, um, we were just setting the table. Uh, we were just getting on station, getting this uh, beautiful spacecraft from uh, from unfolded and ready to do science. So the best is yet to come, and I'll turn it over to, I think, Lee uh, to talk a little bit about the, uh, the telescope. Okay, thanks, Keith. Um, yeah, so after we deployed the mirrors, um, each mirror moved forward by about 12 and a half millimeters. We did position them in their best position to start optical alignment. So we used other degrees of freedom in the actual in the hexapod systems. Um, now all 132 actuators are working completely nominally, and they're working at these very cold temperatures. Uh, the coldest mirror is actually the secondary mirror, which is now about 35 Kelvin, which is roughly minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit. So those actuators are about that temperature. Uh, the, in terms of looking forward, the telescope alignment is going to take about three months, and um, it'll start once near cam is cold enough in about a week. We expect uh, that the telescope alignment will start by looking at a bright isolated star, and we'll get 18 separate images that will be very blurry because these individual telescopes won't be aligned. Uh, so we'll align them, and then we will uh, put those 18 images on top of each other. We call that stacking. And then we start um, the most important part of telescope alignment, which is aligning the primary mirror in a way that we call phasing. And that actually puts the primary mirror, um, all those 18 segments, it, it aligns them to act as a single monolithic mirror. They're actually aligned to about one five thousandth of a human hair. And the final phase of alignment will be to align the, the, the secondary mirror and the primary mirror together in such a way that the telescope is aligned for all four science instruments. And uh, that's the last thing we do, um, and, th and that'll happen during the final phase of the telescope alignment. Uh, so um, should I turn it over to uh, Amy Lowe at Northrop Grumman? Hello, folks. Uh, this is Amy Lowe. And uh, as far as the uh, spacecraft and space vehicle goes, over the next few days, we'll be finishing up a series of our planned calibrations and really dialing in all of our subsystems to where they need to be. What we've been doing over the past month or so has been trending a lot of our telemetry, and as Bill had mentioned previously, uh, getting to know JWST better and better. Um, we're working both uh, at the Mission Operations Center and also here at Redondo Beach, where I am. The spacecraft remains healthy. Uh, like Keith mentioned, one of the highlights has been turning on our high-gain antenna so that we could get high data rates back. Uh, that's been something I was really looking forward to, and uh, it's been great to see it in operation. Moving forward, basically over the, the course of the next week or so, we are getting ready for the real reason why JWST is uh, on there, which is really to support the science instruments 
starting with the turn on and the telescope alignment, like Lee mentioned. So uh, we're pretty excited uh, that the spacecraft portion has been uh, going as well as it has and uh, looking forward to the science instruments. And I think that uh, lets me turn it over to Jane. Hi, hi there, I'm Jane Rigby. I'm the scientist on this panel. So everything we're doing is about getting the observatory ready to do transformative science. That's why we're here. And so over the six month com uh, commissioning period, the next three months, as we said, are all about getting the mirrors aligned. So they're working as one unified telescope. And then the last two months of commissioning, we'll make sure that the science instruments are working and that they are ready to do science. So I'm happy to take questions about that aspect of the process. Also happy to talk about the fantastic science that it, we're planning for the first year that is why we are doing WEB. Um, WEB will be doing more than 300 observing programs in the first year. Most of those fall into four broad science themes about the first generation of galaxies that formed after the Big Bang, how galaxies evolve over the history of the universe, how stars and their planets form, and then all about planetary systems, both our sun's planets and planets that are orbiting other stars. And so two of those key science topics that are, are really great to highlight, we're going to be studying the atmospheres of planets that are orbiting other stars to understand what their atmospheres are made of. Um, in addition, some of those planets might potentially be habitable, and we'll be looking for evidence of habitability. We'll also be studying through these very deep studies of, of dark parts of the sky, the first generation of galaxies that formed more than 13.5 billion years ago. So we're seeing that light uh, only a couple hundred million years after the Big Bang, when it left those galaxies and started a long journey over most of the history of the universe to get to us. So we're a month in, and the baby hasn't even opened its eyes yet, but that's the science that we're looking forward to. Thank you so much to everybody. Uh, we will toss it now to the operator who will open up the lines for questions. And I will remind everybody in the room with me as well as Amy when we answer questions because we are only audio, please do identify yourself every time so everybody knows who you are. And with that, I'll hand it to the operator. At this time, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star one and record your first and last name. Again, that is star one and please record your first name. Our first question comes from Jeff Foss. Your line is now open. You may ask your question. Thank you. Jeff Foss of Space News. I wanted to ask about the timing of the maneuver, why the, the uh, orbit insertion maneuver took place at 2 p.m. on Monday, what was the, the timing that led up to that particular point, particularly when in some of the pre-launch planning we talked about doing the maneuver at L plus 29 days and today is L plus 30 days. Thanks. Yeah, hi, this is uh, Keith Parrish. I'll answer that. So, yeah, so a good thing about uh, how we've been managing our fuel and uh, the maneuvers that we've been that we did for MCC 1A and 1B back on December 25th and December 27th. Wow, long time ago. Anyway, because of that, we had some flex. We had quite a bit of flexibility about when we did this maneuver. So to be, to be very, we chose to do it on Monday at 2 p.m. and that was for logistical reasons for our team, uh, also for our ground resources around the world. Uh, we we just took advantage of uh, of, of everything to to do it today um, because it just made a lot more sense for our team to do it today and it, it, it cost us no penalty. So we did meet, we did move it one day from the 29, as, as you mentioned, uh, but again, no penalty on fuel and uh, it was logistically and technically a better day to do it. Okay, our next question comes from Bill Harwood. Your line is now open, you may ask your question. Thank you. It's Bill Harwood, CBS News. Um, a question for Lee Feinberg. Um, I know the segments, the, the primary mirror segments get positioned one at a time, one actuator at a time. Is there any way to tell us how fast that moves? And fast is probably the wrong word here, but I'm, I'm curious about uh, how, how quickly they can move in rough and fine mode and how long it might take to get a single segment properly positioned if you didn't have to go back and tweak it, how long that process takes for a given segment. Thanks. 
Well, let's see. Um, you know, the big move we the big moves we've already done. Those were sort of the slowest moves. So when we were deploying, we were deploying essentially a millimeter at a time, all 18 mirrors, and um, all 18 primary mirror segments, and the, and the secondary mirror. So all of those actuators together. I mean, that was uh, you know roughly eight hours ish time to do all that to move a millimeter. So that's that gives you some idea of how fast things can move. Um, but in the future, we don't expect to be making moves that are that large. And in fact, the farther we go in the process, the smaller the moves. And so, you know, by by the time we get farther along, it should be they should be pretty quick the moves. Um, a lot of the time, it's just getting set up, you know, with the the right timing on the spacecraft and getting data down, getting data processed. So a lot of the time actually will be spent doing that, not actually moving the the, the mirrors and the motors. Our next question comes from Elizabeth Howe. Your line is now open. You may ask your question. Hello. Uh, thanks, everybody. And this one is for Keith, I think. Is there any chance that you could give some insight as to how these maneuvers went to compared to past missions that were using Lagrange points? Um, maybe if there were any lessons learned you might have taken from these past missions that help with web? Thanks so much. Yeah. So, you know, going to L2 is, is we're not the first. Um, but it's not something you do every day. So every mission is very, very unique. Uh, NASA flew a mission called WMAP uh, quite a while ago that actually used the moon uh, to help with a gravitational assist to get to L2. So every mission is really, really unique. So it's kind of hard to, uh, to, to have a big database of, of uh, learning from those other than the fact that it's been proven that it can be done. Our nav like I said, our flight dynamics team and our navigation team is quite plugged in to uh, the community uh, of, of uh, you know orbit mechanics around the world, so so they 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 are they all knew uh, they all knew how how you would do this. So uh, so so really we didn't uh, other than uh, you know Ariane uh, the Ariane spas had launched a mission um, uh, back a few years back a few years ago that was sort of a, a little bit of pathfinder for them launching something to L2. Uh, so obviously we we, uh, we you know we took took from them how well they could do it and uh, they actually were able to do it a little bit better um, because of their experience uh, launching um, uh, launching the L2. So uh, so yeah, the, no no real lessons learned. Um, what 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 it what it does what that it, what it does take is a, is a lot of, a lot of detailed planning. And again, everything you know was executed flawlessly by mainly by our flight dynamics team as they, as they planned out our route. Uh, to get the L2, and then our spacecraft team, uh, you know, fired the, fired the rockets at the right time. And as a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1. Our next question comes from Marina Corinne. Your line is now open. Hi, everyone. Uh, a question for Keith, I think. Um, now that the L2 burn is behind you, can you give us an updated estimate on how long Webb's science operations might last now, given its fuel supply? What's your most specific estimate now? Yeah, so we, we've had that question before, and I, I think, you know, our, our big burn was back on December 25th. Uh, you know, in, in contrast, that was a, over a 60-minute burn, con, you know, compared to today's five-minute burn. So, as you can see, you know, most of the most of the reporting that we did out um, prior uh, on our longevity of fuels applies and wasn't affected at all by today's maneuver, other than we we used very very tiny amount of fuel. So, so yes, we're very very happy. Um, with our estimated, you know, lifetime and 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 of fuel, it's, it's going to extensively exceed exceed our 10 years. And and whenever we do fine tune a number, which we are going to do, we plan to do that over commissioning. Uh, once we find that fine tune that number, everybody's going to be really thrilled by it. Um, when, once we do, so it's it's just a degree of how thrilled. Um, but ultimately, uh, we'll we'll find we'll keep fine tuning it um, over as we as we get through commissioning. Next question comes from David Curley. Your line is now open. Thank you very much uh, from Discovery Channel. A couple of questions in lay terms. Can you tell us about A3 and A6 mirrors, the fact that you launched with the problem, how that went? Were you nervous? Did it go exactly as you planned? And secondly, um, 
Can you explain L2? Is it kind of like a an eddy in a body of water? I'm just trying to help explain to our audience where you are. Thank you. So this is Lee Feinberg. I'll take the first part of the question. Uh, and I we kind of knew that one was coming. Um, yeah, so a little bit of the history of A3 and A6. I know a lot of people were interested in that. Um, when we After we put the mirrors onto the telescope, this was when we were integrating the telescope at Goddard, um, we did notice that two of the position sensors, these are called LVDTs, um, on, on, it was two of the A-side position sensors and one B-side position sensor were not operating the way we expected. But what we figured out was that these position sensors actually are a differential measurement, which means you're subtracting two things, and one side of them was working fine. And so we realized that if we did a special temperature calibration, we could still use that position sensor. And so that's why those mirrors kind of worked in a different way. Um, we had to, when we, when we used those position sensors, we had to know the temperature and we had to put that into a, sort of our operational sequence. Um, that's all that was. We were very confident it would, it would work. We'd actually had done this before. Um, so, yeah, we weren't particularly worried about it. It was just a different sequence of things. And really what this did is it allowed us, when we were in the integration testing, it just saved a lot of time and effort to try and remove position sensors very late in the game. Um, so this was a way to kind of just do things very efficiently in the, build, the building of the observatory. Can you turn L2 over to... Yeah, you, you want to take the L2, Jane? Yeah. Okay. Or Amy? So you asked for the layman's view of L2, and I will tell you that the way I see it in my head is like a Pringles potato chip, okay? Um, it, isn't a, it isn't a valley. If it's a valley, everything would collect there, and then you'd have a lot of space junk, and that wouldn't be good. It is a saddle point, so it's the, it's the middle of the Pringles potato chip. So it is a semi-stable point in our solar system. It is helpful, you know, we're, we're never, we never want to get over to the other side of the potato chip, then we start drifting away from the Earth, and we don't want to do that. So if you think about staying on one half of the potato chip and just kind of inching up it and then letting it fall back down gently, and then inch your little stone back up and then let it fall back down, but never get over the top of the potato chip. That's what we're doing in L2. We're in orbit around L2 on the Earth side um, so we don't drift away. And that's what we do. We're just going to keep pushing the rock up the potato chip and letting it fall down for the life of the mission. I'm going to use that as a headline. <laughs> oh, no. It's <laughs> a good analogy. Our next question comes from Leo Inright. Your line is now open. And Mr. Leo Enright, if you could please check your mute button. Okay, are you hearing me now? Yes. Okay, I have a potato chip question. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> I, I'm just wondering what your margin of error was today. Yeah, the delta V was something like 1.5 meters per second which is kind of, I guess, what I would do if I had to just run a little bit faster after my dog uh, if I was going for a walk. So I'm just wondering, what was your margin of error before you went over the top of the potato chip and ended up spinning off into space? Yeah, and, and this is Keith Parrish, by the way. So, so exactly right. Our, our, whole, our, our whole goal of go, getting out to the L2 point is to, to not exceed what we needed. So we inched our way there, uh, and we started that inching with the launch of the Ariane. We actually told them to not make us too fast. So actually put us a little lower than, than what would be ideal. Uh, and then we then we put in a little bit more velocity with our with our Christmas Day MCC 1A maneuver. Uh, then we took a little bit of a look at that and we put a little bit more velocity in with MCC 1B. So we did so well with those first two maneuvers. We just needed a little bit more today, um, but we always underburn. So even though we were only putting in uh, you know roughly 1.5 meters per second, as as you described, is not a very <laughs> very much very much uh, extra. Um, it was still a little bit under. We'll get a report out, uh, a full report out from our flight dynamics team later t tonight or tomorrow on whether that was, you know, 1.4155 all the way out to a lot of decimal places. The bottom line here is that uh, uh, we did not overshoot and we are in orbit around L2. Um, so even if we had not done the 1.5 
uh, today, we still would have been in orbit around L2. We would have not overshot it. What would have happened is we, we, we like to tune the size and shape of our orbit by, by doing these really, really tiny, tiny maneuvers. And the best way to think about it is that this, we have station keeping maneuvers that we have to do you know, as Jane said, to, to keep us uh, keep us uh, keep us there at L2. So every 21 days, uh, roughly, uh, we're going to fire that station keeping thruster again, even smaller than we did today, uh, to, to to keep us on there. But we're always we're always on the air. We're always going on the low side. Um, so on the low side, our margin of error was was very large because we really didn't even have to do the maneuver to get into L2. We really wanted to do today's maneuver to to shape our orbit like we wanted it. Um, and, and, and any more than that, um, you know, any, any more than that, we, you know, you, you could overshoot, but we've been planning on undershooting for, you know, since we launched. So hopefully that helps. Our next question comes from Greg Redfern. Your line is now open. Thank you, everybody. And I think this is for you, Lee, uh, for our listeners at WTOP Radio. You mentioned that the telescope will be focused, the 18-year segments, using a bright star. Have you identified what star you will use? And if not, how will you go about determining which star you will use? And thank you very much, and way to go. Way to go today. All right. Thank you, WTOP. Um, So, yeah, this is Lee Feinberg. So, yeah, we actually have chosen the star. Um, we needed a br- we need a bright isolated star, and the idea is the reason we want it isolated is we don't want to get confused when we have these 18 separate telescopes, you know, and have too many stars essentially. But the star is HD 84406. It's uh, it's in Ursa Major. It's um, just near the bowl of the Big Dipper, and um, you can't quite see it with your naked eye, but I'm told you can see it with uh, binoculars. So for those of you who want to go take a look at it. It, it was dependent on sort of, you know, the, the period of time that we'd be, you know, uh, doing this. So, um, you know, which star we use kind of changed, but this looks like the star we'll be using since uh, we expect to be getting going in, in sort of next week. So that's, it's a G5. And it's a G5, as so Jane just said. So, yeah, which means it's a, a lot like our sun. Cool. Next question comes from Marcia Dunn. Your line is now open. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, I'm, I know that uh, Webb is sharing L2 with the two other operating spacecraft. I'm, ju- I'm just wondering, um, any chance of a collision? I, I, would, I know it's a big space out there, but um, how, how do you keep them apart safely? And at the end of its working lifetime, would Webb be um, removed from that orbit um, so it doesn't, you know, Become a threat down the road, or how will that work? I'm I'm just trying to get a handle on how long, how many years now will L2 uh, will Web be at L2? Thanks. Yeah, hi. This is Keith Parrish. Uh, let's see. So L2 is a, is is a is a spot. However, we orbit L2 in a very large orbit, so it's not crowded. Uh, it's much less, extremely less crowded than Earth orbit. So there's no risk of uh, interacting with any other spacecraft. Take about 180 days for us to do our loop or racetrack around our orbit at L2. Uh, I don't want to get exact numbers, but it's roughly 800,000 kilometers is the diameter of our, our, of our orbit. So it's very large. And that's one thing we, we designed, you know, like I said, our flight dynamics team designed that orbit uh, to be very large around L2, and, and, you know, t- because it is, you can take advantage of, of all that room. So what happens at the end when we do run out of fuel? Yes, we do. Uh, we do leave a little bit of fuel. Uh, uh, left over so that we can, you know, passivate web if we need to, uh, you know, and, and what that'll do is it'll just put us into a solar orbit uh, around around the sun at that point. So there is, that that can be done if we're required to do that. Uh, but what we don't want to do is, uh, uh, you know, L2 is stable, is unstable, as, as, as Jane uh, mentioned earlier, so you do have to maintain that. So, if, so yes, we would, uh, at the end of its mission, uh, some future folks will make that decision and uh, uh, maneuver us safely into a, a solar orbit. Thanks. Next question goes, comes from Joel Arkenbach. Your line is now open. Yeah, thanks so much, and congrats on how the mission is going. Um, to, just to, to be clear about uh, looking at this star, it sounded like you said that that 
could start as soon as a week from now. One thing I'm wondering is, right now, is there light being gathered by the telescope? I mean, can and, and do your instruments are they turned on at all? I mean, do you have any data coming back showing that that uh, essentially, although it's not the mirrors are not aligned and you you, you wouldn't have a clear image. Uh, I mean, is it is it fundamentally working? Can you address that? Yeah, I mean, we have not started, this is Lee Feinberg, we have not started taking images yet. Um, the instruments have to be cold enough. Um, to start the, the telescope alignment, we need the near cam instrument in particular. Um, and initially, we've had some uh, heaters on to prevent ice from building up. Those have to be turned off in the next week, and then things have to get cold enough. The detectors and the optics have to be cold enough to actually get an image. Um, so light is getting through the telescope. Um, but it's not being recorded on a detector at this point. Um, so so that's that's really where we are at this point. I apologize. Is, is this Keith or Lee talking? Th that was Lee Feinberg talking. As Lee, it, as you said, light is getting through the telescope. How do you, how do you tell that? Well, it's just if you look at the design of the telescope, um, it's sort of an open architecture in a sense. And we know that the primary mirror is facing deep space, so we know starlight is hitting it. Uh, it's not well focused. Um, we know that that light's then hitting the secondary mirror, especially now that the mirrors are in their deployed state. They're pretty close to a real telescope in terms of their alignment. And then um, the, the next optic is the tertiary mirror, and it's open to the tertiary mirror, and it finds light hitting the fine steering mirror. At that point, some of the light gets stopped in the instruments where there's some, you know, there might be something to block the light. Um, some of the instruments, you know, the light can get all the way through. So we know, we just know based on the design that it's getting through there, but we don't have any detection yet. We won't have that, in, as I mentioned, until next week when we start the alignment and the instruments are cold enough. Thank you. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star one. Our next question comes from Lisa Grossman. Your line is now open. Hi, thanks so much for taking the time to do this. Um, I was wondering how long it takes Webb to complete, well, so there's two orbits going, right? There's the um, Webb or doing the up and down the Pringle orbit, and then the Pringle orbits the sun. How long do each of those orbits take? Yeah, so this is Keith, uh, Keith again. So the, to go around our orbit at L2 or around L2 is about six months. Um, again, a very, very large halo orbit. As we're doing that, uh, we're going around the sun, you know, in a year with the Earth uh, to keep that Earth sun always aligned with us. So, uh, yeah, it's it's basically we're around the, going around the Earth. I mean, going around the sun with the Earth, and then we're doing this uh, large halo orbit again. It takes about six months to go around that racetrack or that orbit. Thank you. Next question comes from Hagen Warren. Your line is now open. Hello, Hagen Warren with NASA Space Flight. Thank you for taking my question, um, and a massive congratulations to the entire team. Uh, my question is, with Webb now at L2, how is the process of cooling the observatory going? You know, how is the cryocooler operating, and is the temperature where the team expected it to be by this point? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So just to clarify, most of the cooling is happening passively because the telescope and the science instruments are in the shadow of the sun shield. So most of that cooling, you know, the, as, um, as Lee said, that the primary, the secondary mirrors, 35, 35, 35 Kelvin. Kelvin, that's really cold, right? 35 degrees above that absolute zero, right? So all of that is happening passively. It's just hiding in the shadow, and it's really dark there, and there's uh, we're rejecting all but one part in a million of all the sun's energy, right? So it's a, a kilowatt per square meter on the hot side, and it's a couple milliwatts on the cold side, right? SPF a million. So that's why things are cooling. It's just cooling because it's in the dark, cold shadow. There is a cryocooler on board. Just to be clear, a cryocooler means it's a closed cell refrigerator. It's not like previous missions like Spitzer or Herschel, which have cryogen on board that evaporates out the space. We're not doing that. We have a closed cell refrigerator, a cryocooler. That's not on yet, right? So that doesn't happen until these instruments get cool. And this is a good point to say that as everything's cooling, we are spending a ton of time watching those science instruments and protecting parts of them that need to stay warm. 
um, as they cool. So there's a really careful process where we're tracking the temperatures of, oh my gosh, dozens of, um, in each science instrument, dozens of pieces in each science instrument, and controlling the temperatures as they cool. So everything's cooling down, and then we're keeping some parts warmer to make sure that ice doesn't get deposited in, um, uh, along the optical train. So the cryocooler is a step that will come later. And that's, I should say, sorry, this was Jane Rigby. Um, and that the cryocooler is just for MIRI. That's our mid-infrared instrument. That's the instrument that has to stay the coldest. So the operating temperatures for most of the instruments is about 40 degrees above absolute zero. MIRI gets chilled down with that cryocooler down to seven Kelvin, seven degrees above absolute zero. Our next question comes from Philip Fulogorski. Your line is now open. Hi, I'm Philip Fulogorski from the Science Channel of the Polish Public Television. First of all, congratulations on all the JWST mission successes, and I wish you some more great discoveries. Uh, and my question, as the Lagrange L2 point is not fully completely stable, JWST needs some corrections in time to stay on the right orbit. How often and when they will be done? And the second question, uh, how do you determine the precise position of JWST and in space? Is the measurement based on position of the stars or maybe you have different methods? And thank you for the opportunity to ask a question. Yeah, hi, it's Keith Parrish again. So yeah, so we do we do maintain the L2 orbit. Uh, and again, the prediction is that every three weeks or 21 days, we'll do a small firing of the uh, station keeping I mean, engine or thruster that we use today. Uh, I, I should remind everybody that when we launched, uh, James Webb was a completely different spacecraft. It was all folded up. So we had a thruster uh, in a different location today was our first use of our station keeping thruster because we're all unfolded and we're in an actual observatory. So yeah, every 21 days, we're gonna use that station keeping thruster. Again, it could be 18 days, it could be 25. We'll, we'll let our, again, we'll let our flight dynamics team uh, figure all that out for us over, over the next few weeks. Uh, and then as far as position in space, again, our flight dynamics team uh, does that via what we call Doppler uh, tracking of our radio signals to, to the ground station and how fast our ground station antennas are, are tracking us. Uh, so they use a couple different tools, mainly mainly the Doppler uh, method on the radio waves to, uh, to, to actually track our speed, our, our velocity, location, and speed uh, in combination with some other methods. So that's how they tell where we are in space and what direction we're going. Uh, and they and they 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 uh, they, uh, they uh, assess that data over long periods of time as they gather it on the ground. As far as where we're pointing, um, you know that that's that's part of the, uh, the, the 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 science program and and where to point and and right ascension declination. That's all controlled by our ground system for pointing the telescope uh, for, to whatever observation uh, is of interest. Uh, hi there. This is Amy Lowe. Uh, just to add that. Also on board, we have a slew of instruments on the spacecraft, like the star trackers and the fine sun sensors, that lets us measure where the sun position is and where the stars are to know our attitude, i.e. where JWST mirrors are pointed in space. Our next question comes from Irene Quote. Your line is now open. You may ask your question. Thank you, Irene Quox with Aviation Week. Um, sorry if I missed this. Is the primary mirror also, the segments also now at the 35 Kelvin, or is the, that cooling still continuing? And is, um, uh, for the, thanks for the detail on the HD 84406. Is that <laughs> star intended to be used for the kind of entire three month alignment and stacking process, or is that? Just one target of, or of, of possibly many that will be used during the uh, during the uh, time to align the the segment. Thanks. Yeah. Um. So we pick a star that is in an area they call the continuous viewing zone. So we'll use it as long as we can, but we expect to hand off stars as we go here. Um. So so that's sort of the plan. And as far as the temperature, um, the primary mirror is actually warmer. 
um, by design. Actually, the secondary mirror is the coldest mirror, so that's it, it will be the coldest mirror ultimately, and that's why it's the coldest right now. The the telescope mirrors vary from roughly 60 degrees Kelvin to 80 degrees Kelvin, which I don't know in Fahrenheit, but it's probably like uh, minus 350 degrees ish Fahrenheit, roughly. <laughs> yeah. The minus 60, minus 50. Yeah. And and um, there will be the mirrors won't all be the same temperature even on the primary mirror. There's actually you know different temperatures as you go up the primary mirror, and we're seeing some of that distribution right now. The the wing mirrors tend to be a little colder right now. They have a little bit more view of deep space. The mirrors in the center um, are attached to a lot of mass, and so they take a little bit more time to cool down. But everything is cooling down really well, so uh, we're really happy. And uh, thank you to the SunShield team who did obviously a great job because. For the mirrors to be this cold already, um, they're right where they should be. So, so we're feeling really good about where we're going to be. And in fact, the, the secondary mirror is already in its operating temperature range, and the primary mirrors are just hitting that operating temperature range. That's really critical because that's the temperature at which we know the mirrors will perform the way we expect. So, uh, so we're right on the verge of that now. Thanks. And is the near cam uh, target temperature the 35K? No, um, so, well, it depends on which temperature you're talking about, but the temperature we need to start the, the wavefront process, the telescope alignment process, we need the, the optics and the detectors more along the lines of about 100 Kelvin, um, but ultimately the detectors will cool more in the lines of like 50 to 60 Kelvin. Okay, so, this, so the point you're waiting for for next week is to get to 100 K and then you can start with the, uh, exactly. Yeah, once near cam is uh, cold enough, both in its optics and detectors, detectors have to be cold enough so that they can actually form an image, um, and the optics have to get cold enough because they're actually designed to work at these very cold temperatures. They don't work as well at warm temperatures. That's kind of true of the mirrors, but it's also true of the optics inside of um, near cam. So we need everything to kind of be at these cold temperatures. Thanks very much. Our next question comes from Assam Ahaman. Your line is now open. Yeah, thanks for taking my question, and um, congratulations to the whole team. Um, uh, this one, I guess, for Keith, um, just to push further, I think you said you'd be, uh, it, it, the remaining fuel should allow for more than 10 years, and you'd be, uh, we'd be announcing a figure soon, and would be, you know, people would be thrilled. Would you be able to give us uh, any idea of how much longer than 10 years that might look like? And uh, then again, for Keith, or possibly Amy Lowe, I mean, hypothetically speaking, uh, could a future mission, either crude or uh, robotic, uh, refuel the telescope, you know, to take a big jerry can up there or, or replace some component which could, you know, add to its life, hypothetically speaking? Thank you. Yeah. Hey, this is uh, Keith. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to fuel, uh, we we are incredibly we we have plenty of fuel. We we probably should take that off the table. Uh, we're gonna ex you know extensively you know exceed our ten ten year life, uh, and 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 you know you've heard numbers around twenty years. We think that's probably a good ballpark, um, but uh, so but we're trying to refine that. So we don't think fuel is you know it's really going to be off of our mind uh, as far as you know a life limiting thing uh, going forward, regardless of what the final number is. Uh, like I said before, it's it's gonna you know we're 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 just we're all gonna be thrilled. I think the astronomical community is thrilled. Um, you know the folks who built and designed Web and and every everybody's just thrilled by that final number. So it's gonna be, you know, like I said, you've you've heard you've heard some of the numbers out there, and and they'll they'll be right around there when when we fine tune it. As far as refueling Web, again, we don't anticipate a need to do that. Uh, again, we don't know what condition Web will be in in general when it does run out of fuel. That's a long long way down the road, um, but uh, and we never want to limit our imagination. So I say never, uh, but right now we don't anticipate a need to do that. Uh, again, uh, not quite understanding what condition web will be and, and, and say that two decades from now. Uh, but uh, people are creative, and as you know, right now things are going, you know, the, the advances in space flight are really going well. So who knows? Who knows what some future – Folks may want to do with web uh, and visit it and do something, uh, but right now there's absolutely no need to, to think about fuel or refueling. Thanks. Our next question comes from Steve Gorman. Your line is now open. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks very much. I have so many questions. I guess the one thing I wanted to ask about is this, the cooling down process. 
So uh, again, just to make sure I understand. So you're waiting to till next week, because that's the point at which you you expect that by then, uh, the I think it's called the mirror cam. This cam one one of the four instruments going to be that be necessary to use to help align the the uh, the primary mirror, mirror will be cold enough down to about 100 Kelvin for it to operate properly in order to to do the alignment process with the with the mirrors. Right, that's what you're waiting for. And yeah. Yeah, so um, this is oh, – go ahead. Okay, and, and then, Mike, I guess – so I just want to make sure I answer that correctly. And then the other thing was, when you uh, – just to explain to readers, we keep talking about waiting for the the, uh, the various parts of the of this observatory to cool down sufficiently to whatever whatever uh, uh, temperature they need to operate out, you know, optimally. What is – just I, – I believe I know the answer to this, but are we waiting basically for the, 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 the telescope as a whole to – Cool down, waiting for basically residual heat that's mainly mainly from solar exposure to dissipate in the shadow shadow of the sun of the sun shield, right? It's cooling down from what, in other words, it's cooling down. Yeah. From okay. So. Heat. Yeah. So let me help you out a little bit. Let me start with um, the near cam instrument. So a really key point is that, um, and this is a very unique thing about Webb. There's no there's no other there's ground telescopes don't do things this way, but we're using the, the main one of the one of the science instruments the near-infrared camera, as our wavefront sensor. And we've actually inserted special little optical elements inside of the filter wheel, little lenses and other things that are going to help us align the telescope. Um, but that near-infrared camera does have to be cold enough just to be able to, first of all, its detectors don't work at warm temperatures, so they have to be cold enough that they can, they can take images. Um, and we need the optics to work well. So, yeah, that's what we're waiting for. As we go along the wavefront sensing control process, the alignment process, um, we will also be using the guider to stabilize things, and that happens about 10 days later. The guider actually has to get even colder, closer to 65 Kelvin. Um, so, so those are the big drivers there. And in terms of the cooling, well, so um, you know, it was discussed earlier that this is the whole system is passively cooled. The reason we put up this large sun shield, these five layers of sun shield, is so that the telescope over time will cool down. You could think of it as um, it's what we call black body emission, but basically. We're trying to get the heat out of the system. Things, you know, the telescope started at a warm temperature, right, when we launched it, and it just takes a long time. You're emitting heat out towards deep space, which is extremely cold, um, and it just takes a long time to do that. So that's partially what we're waiting for. The mirrors have to get cold enough, number one, so that they don't generate infrared light, which would contaminate our images. That's why they have to be our mirrors. Like for example, in the primary mirror, they're designed to work between 30 and 55 Kelvin, and that assures that not only do we affect, not, we won't affect the near-infrared instrument, but we'll also not affect, affect the mid-infrared instrument. So we have to get them cold enough. But they're attached to a structure behind them that is also very warm, and that structure has to cool down. And that's sort of what takes the most time, is that big, heavy mass that's holding it. It's actually a large composite structure, a bunch of harnesses, and all of that has to kind of slowly radiate heat to deep space. And not only that, for the tail end of our process, we have to get everything stable. So it's not just cooling it down to a low temperature, but it's getting it sufficiently stable because that primary mirror with those 18 mirrors, those mirrors have to be stable relative to one another. That's not typical of any other telescope. Even ground telescopes don't do things this way. Um, they actually have special little active things that keep the mirrors aligned. On our system, we have to get everything not only cold, but stable. So those two things kind of drive us. The cold drives us in the beginning to get images, and the stable drives us sort of midway through the alignment process so that we can converge on our solution. Hope, hope that was helpful. Yeah, I thank you so much. But just, but I, if I just say that the thing is cooling down, but it's basically just it's it's radiating off its its the, the, the residual heat of the overall structure. It takes time for that to dissipate into space. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Our next question comes from Paul Brinkman. Your line is now open. You may ask your question. Hi, yeah, this is Paul with United Press International. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Um, I think this is for Keith or Jane regarding the commissioning timeline and uh, first release images. Um, I know you aren't going to tell us what those images will show. Um, and sorry if I missed this at some point, but does anyone know when those images will be released? What does that timeline depend on? And specifically, will you be able to release images taken during commissioning or, or do, does the public have to wait like the full five additional months to see something? Thanks. 
This is Jane Rigby. The plan is to release the, um, the first beautiful images um, in a press conference about six months after launch. So that's about five months from now. So those are the, the early release observations, the EROs. So that is the set of data that show that the telescope is working, that the science instruments are working, and that this is indeed the transformative telescope that we expect it to be. I think you're also asking if there's additional data at that time. When we finish commissioning, we will, all, we will release all the data from commissioning. So commissioning ends after that ERO press conference and we'll open up the archive at that point and so the commissioning data will be in there. So that means interested scientists from around the world can go take a look at that data. A lot of it won't be very interesting because it'll be those ugly fuzzy pictures of stars out of focus that, that we had to laboriously drive into focus, but there will be some fields that will be of scientific interest, and we'll open up that archive um, at the end of commissioning. And this is Karen Fox. Uh, just quickly, uh, a lot of this is, is still in conversation, and so, uh, you know, as you've been hearing, there's a lot of different testing along the way, and if there is something that we can share before then, we certainly will. We're, we're, so, so the last question there was, what does it all depend on? And the answer is it depends on everything, and, okay. and we will definitely be sharing what we can when we can. Our next question comes from Leah Crane. Your line is now open. Hi. Uh, my questions have most have already been asked. I was just going to ask if we're going to be able to see commissioning images before that press conference. So this is Karen Fox again, and and the answer is is absolutely we'll share what we can when we can if we can, um, but it's certainly as Jane was saying there will be test images, lights, things that don't even look like stars. Uh, so, but if there's something that we can show, we certainly will. Thank you. But don't hold me to anything. We're figuring it out. That's, that was the point I was making. <laughs> Next question comes from Daniel Ricardo. Your line is now open. Uh, hi, how you doing? Thank you. Uh, this is uh, Daniel from Ardron UI. We are a Spanish multimedia communication company. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, uh, the first question, you, ha you have two little short questions. Uh, the first one is, when are you expecting uh, for the first exoplanet observation? And the second one, sure, uh, based on the on the experience of building James Webb on 20 more than 20 years, uh, if you have new plans for make a new one, but quicker. Thank you. <laughs> we'll all take <laughs> All right. I think this is Jane Rigby. I think I get both of those. Um, hola. Hi there. Um, the first question was about uh, exoplanets. There are a series of programs, there are 13 of them, early release science programs, not to be convinced, uh, confused with EROs, early release science programs that are designed to execute in the first three months of our normal science operations. And those include two different programs to study extrasolar planets. Uh, one of them is a direct imaging. We'll be looking at a uh, planetary system by directly imaging it and blocking out the light of the star in a way that is a lot more complicated, but I always think of it as sticking your thumb over the pit, over the sun, over the star so you can see the planets. Um, and then there's also a transit spectroscopy program in there, so studying a planet that goes in front of its star, and so you see the light of the star going through the atmosphere to you. Those ERS programs, early release science, uh, are designed to be, we're going to front load them in our schedule, so we will observe them as much as possible in the first three months of normal science operations. The second half of your question was? Future. No. Oh, future missions. Um, so certainly the Webb telescope, this, this method of deploying a telescope in space, of curling it up to fit inside the rocket and then unfurling it once, to, once it gets to space, 
um, that is something that we could do again. And in fact, the, uh, the once every 10 years, the decadal survey of astronomy just came out, uh, Astro 2020, and indeed recommended a deploy, a, recommended a large telescope in space. Um, and the obvious way to do that is to deploy it in space. So yes, indeed, people are working on what the future would look like of future big telescopes in space. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Really. Our next question comes from Pezen Rabi. Your line is now open. Hello. Um, so I was just wondering, now that uh, James Webb is, is getting ready to observe, I'm wondering if along its orbit, are there certain points in its orbit that are better suited for observing certain targets, like halfway through the orbit, it's better suited to observe in Solidus, for example? So our orbit, so the web orbit is basically, you know, on the, the anti-sun direction from the Earth, right? So it's out there and it's in this little orbit around L2 going around twice a year. Um, the main thing for scheduling, like when can we observe what, is that we have to keep the sun shield such that the, the, the sun and the, moon and the Earth are blocked to the telescope, right? The telescope never gets sunlight on it again. That's the goal. It doesn't get Earth light on it either. So that means that that part of the sky down where the sun shield is, we can't look at it any, you know, at a given time. So at a given time, Webb can see about a third of the sky, it's 35%. And then that field of regard where we can legally point, that rotates slowly as the Earth and, and Webb go around the sun. And so any point in the sky is accessible over the course of a year to Webb. Webb can look at any given point in the sky um, during the course of a year, but at any one time, it can look at about a third of the sky. So this is part of what factors in as we make schedules. We take all of the, the targets that have been approved, and then we work out a schedule that minimizes the travel time between each target, like how far we have to turn the telescope, um, and that, of course, you know, gets each target when it's observable. And there's a bunch of other factors too, like how dark the sky is for that, that piece of the sky, which changes with the, with the year. Hi, uh, this is Karen Fox. We are coming up on the hour. We have two more questions from people who haven't been able to ask questions yet, and we will be taking those too, but then we will be wrapping it up. As always, if you have something you want to follow up on or extra questions that didn't get answered, you should feel free to send us an email, and we will try to get you additional information. Um, but back to the operator for those last two. Next question comes from Jakai Goddard. Your line is now open. Hi, Jackie Goddard from the Times of London. Um, and congratulations, everyone. So we know that those big nail biter um, milestones are out of the way. But what if you now um, switch something on and it doesn't work? How much risk is now retired? To what extent is any potentially still ahead? Um, is there really anything that you could have got all of this way and then find that there could yet be a showstopper. Thank you. Uh, uh, hi there. Uh, this is Amy Lowe. I'll just uh, answer first for the uh, spacecraft and sun shield portion. So in terms of all of the uh, nuts and bolts on the uh, observatory of things that operate like the, on the spacecraft, everything has been switched on and checked out, so we don't expect anything not to operate. Um, and I'll hand it over to the rest of the team for the uh, telescope instruments. Yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, the telescope, you know, we still um, have yet to get optical images, so we still need to go through that and prove all of the optical systems work. Um, as far as, you know, doing the actual alignment with the instruments, I mean, our plan is to do it with the near-infrared camera, which I mentioned earlier. That, that instrument has internal redundancy. Um, so that's a good thing. And then we also have um, developed contingency plans to be able to operate even if there was an instrument that wasn't working. So there is a lot of robustness in our ability to do the alignment process. Um, and then, of course, the instruments all have to come on, and um, they have some levels of internal redundancy, but they're all, they're all unique. So, if, you know, so each instrument kind of has to come on and 
prove themselves in a sense. So that's kind of what's in front of us. Thank you. Our last question comes from Marcia Smith. Your line is now open. You may ask your question. Thanks so much. Uh, I just had a couple of numbers that I was looking for. What was the exact duration of the burn today? You said it was about five minutes. Was it exactly five minutes? And is that about the duration of the burns every 21 minutes? And one last question, because I'm still trying to get my mind around a potato chip analogy. So if one orbit, at, if the center of the orbit at the bottom of the chip and one orbit is up oh, no. and, Sorry. and down and then up and back down again, is that one orbit? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, hi, this is Keith. I'm going to throw that potato chip over to Jane since she caused all this uh, confusion. <laughs> but uh, no, on the on the burn duration, yes, it was five minutes. Um, there, we we don't know. We have to download all the data from the spacecraft to get. A, again, we are incredibly precise and accurate, so we're really talking about out to the millisecond when our thruster turned on and when our thruster turned off. So that's the kind of accuracy uh, that we're looking for. But it was commanded to be five minutes. Uh, and uh, the actual station keeping burns that we'll do roughly every 21 days are going to be significantly less than that uh, on the order of a minute or, or, or even less sometimes. So, uh, yes, we uh, – and, again, I think it's important to get back to, to the fuel question. In fact, we, we – our use of fuel for getting to L2 is over, uh, and we used – you know, we didn't even use, you know, nearly a third of our allocation to that. So all the fuel that we have left is for station keeping – which are small burns every once every three weeks, and then to uh, dump the momentum, uh, which is built up in our reaction wheels as the, as the uh, solar pressure uh, pushes us around a little bit. So that's that's the you know, roughly five minutes, and and we expect a full report from our flight dynamics team again tomorrow after they assess the data. But we're really talking out into the milliseconds of, of differences between you know five minutes and, and maybe five point one zero zero minutes. We, we don't know that yet. Um, and for potato chip analogies, oh, I'm going to go back to, to Jane. That's my fault. Well, <laughs> you know, I can make this worse because I can put a donut on the potato chip, <laughs> right? So yeah, the, if you've got an orbit, if you've got an orbit going around the the sloping down part of the potato chip, right? Then so you got a donut on your potato chip, right? Then that's that 180 days twice a year um, orbit. But the point is, we just want to stay on our side of that, right? We're on. This, on um, uh, we're, we're, and that's why, as Keith was saying, we, we do these underburn and underburn, and we've creeped up to, that's why we've done three burns, to creep up to the orbit that we want to be in. And now we're there. So you are in a circular orbit. Yes. Yes, that's right. We're in a circular orbit around the second Lagrange point. We don't want to be exactly at the second Lagrange point. For one thing, then we'd be in the shadow of the... Of the Earth, kind of right? elliptical shape. So yeah, it's an elliptical squashed thing. Yeah. But there's lots of orbits that are fine. We just need to be in a nice orbit around the second Lagrange point. That way, we always have sun on the solar array. Okay, thank you. I'm not going to give you an on gravitational wells and how the uh, right, so. angle uh, was was meant to show where what where the forces are. Um, this is Karen Fox again. Uh, thank you so much for everybody being here today. And uh, as I said, you should feel free to contact us if uh, you didn't manage to get a question answered or if you have something uh, that you need a follow up on. Thank you so much to all of our speakers today, and uh, looking forward to this whole journey with you over the next five months. We'll we'll be continuing to update you as we go. As you know, NASA.gov slash web, W-E-B-B, is where we host things. Uh, you can get to our blog from there with mission milestones, as well as uh, our where's web and some of the other information we have up. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you for your participation. That concludes today's call. You may disconnect at this time. Speakers, please stand by.